You've thrown us out, then fenced us in. You've called us renegades and murderers, yet you praise us for our resilience and determination. You've despised us in times of weakness and praised us when we were strong. You've alternately abandoned us to our fate and courted us when it suited your pleasure. Is it any wonder that we guard our wallets when you offer us your so-called friendship? Isn't it enough to know that we sicken at the sight of your kind? Commodore Sigur Fawn, speech given to a Terran ambassador, October 15th, 2415. It has been said that the most intense violence comes from the man who wished to be left alone. This is an idea that I felt myself returning to over and over again as I organized the research for this explanation of the periphery. It's important because the history of the inner sphere is inexorably linked to the push and pull relationship between Terra and those who don't want to play the game and just wish to be left alone to go their own way. We see this in the early days of space exploration when humanity was just barely dipping a toe into the galaxy around them. Some of the earliest colonies within that 50 light year radius around Earth were seeded with people who fled the planet, were kicked out, were even sent as slave labor because they were considered political undesirables or even a quote unquote threat to alliance security. Of the original 500 settlers sent to the new Earth colony, 50 of them were prisoners. Banishment is, and has always been, an important method for societal control. From the days of the hunter-gatherers through Bronze and Iron Ages, removing someone who was dangerous or otherwise broke the social contract helped maintain the cohesion of the whole. Therefore, it made perfect sense for the fragile Terran Alliance to see it as an opportunity to literally send their problems out into the void. And they did so, in great numbers, for a while. By the 2500s, human and drone exploration had mapped out 90% of the star systems within a 50 light year radius around Terra. The ability to travel across those vast distances also had advanced beyond those first rudimentary Kirne Fushida drives. As with technological developments through history, over time the cost and availability of space travel gradually fell to the point that corporations and even private individuals could fund their own space exploration and colonization initiatives. And once people could willingly leave Terra without the permission of the Terran government, or as punishment for their political activism, the Terran Alliance decided to reconsider their stance on expelling people they didn't want out into the void. Two of those ships that left without any government backing or sponsorship were the Juilliard and the Rochambeau, who would successfully found colonies on the planets Ride, Severin, Rochelle, and Freedom. You may want to remember Freedom for later. If you've ever worked with a city bureaucrat before, you know the one thing that makes them the angriest and the most spiteful is when you don't ask permission to do something or neglect to pay them their pound of flesh. In 2128, the Terran Alliance Parliament passed the Colonization Procedure Referendum, which was advertised as a way to maintain safety and security in space colonization. However, in practice, it was a power grab intended to limit the immigration of people from Terra. People were savvy enough to understand that once the government starts to limit your access to something, that's when you know it's valuable. It was increasingly obvious that the future of humanity and all of the wealth and wonders it would possess would be found off of Terran soil. Even with the nationalization of interstellar travel, people simply ignored the laws and left anyway. It's nice to know that civil disobedience manages to survive the 21st century. The prospect of being able to leave Earth and travel to an untouched planet to make your own way was a powerful draw. Similarities to Western expansion and migration across those Western states by American settlers is an obvious historical precedent. Of course, with the caveat that there were no native populations on those planets being settled. Still, for many of those American settlers, owning your own land was something that had been denied their families for as long as anyone could remember. Being in control of your own destiny, even if it was at great risk, was the core of that American dream. And so people continued to leave, settling new planets and setting up their own systems of government and social organization. Any illusion of control that the Terran Alliance had over this process was increasingly weak. Of course, the government rarely gives up power, even if they never really had it. And while people paid their life savings for seats on ships leaving Terra, the Terran Alliance Navy ships patrolled the space around the planet looking to stop blockade runners. This went about as well as you might expect. People kept leaving, 
and the Alliance's control over the situation continued to degrade. One of the most famous and possibly infamous pro-immigrant advocates of the time was Rudolf Ryan. He was a successful industrialist and entrepreneur who made a ridiculous amount of money developing ships that could carry large amounts of ice across interstellar distances. This was a crucial development for multiple reasons. The first was adding water to otherwise inhospitable planets vastly increased the number of worlds that could be colonized. The second was that the network of ice haulers was perfect for shuffling people and goods across planets, improving the success rate of colonies. Ryan saw Terra as just one hub among many thousands of colonized planets in a network of human progress. He wanted planets to enjoy prosperity and independence away from the old Terran systems, prejudices, and political repression. So what does this all add up to? People bring things with them when they settle. Not just physical goods, but also their ideas, worldviews, philosophy, initially on purpose, and then later by being unable to control events. The Terran Alliance had seeded the inner sphere with people who generally wanted to be left alone to do their own thing. By 2235, there were more than 600 colonies within 120 light years from Terra. While this would be impressive at a glance, it was horrific for the Terran Alliance, who could only realistically say about 60% of them were within the Alliance governance and economic system. The others were either going it alone or formulating small alliances of nearby planets and systems. Some of them were even openly hostile towards the Terran Alliance. Remember I mentioned that settlement of a colony called Freedom? In 2336, the colonists decided it was their time to assert independence from that Terran Alliance. Who could have predicted that outcome from a colony named Freedom, right? Shocking, I know. The reasons given for this included heavy-handed alliance meddling within the colony, high taxes, and inept alliance officials continually sent to the colony who ignored concerns from the people. This all sounds vaguely familiar. Naturally, the Terran Alliance leadership from Geneva reacted by becoming completely unhinged and voting for a direct military intervention. The Alliance military was champing at the bit to get involved in a glorious military campaign and the drums of war were beaten like it was going out of style. A large armada of military vessels were assembled under the leadership of Major General Gunther Stein. Now, as shocked as you might be to hear that a military campaign run by a man named Gunther did not go well, I have to say, brace yourself. From the start, the armada was plagued with problems as colonies along the path to freedom were generally unhelpful. The governments of allied planets discovered a litany of reasons why they could not offer requested supplies and manpower. Stein originally estimated his entire venture would take about 18 months from beginning to end. However, it slowly dawned on him and the rest of the Alliance that the Terran government was not nearly as popular as they thought, even among those planets who were nominally part of it. Gradually cut off from their sources of resupply and finding themselves deep in territory that was unexpectedly hostile, the Alliance Armada jumped into the Freedom System. No one considered the possibility that the Nadir and Zenith jump points would be defended. Merchant ships equipped with weapons and additional armor opened fire on the incoming Alliance jump ships. When the Alliance was able to start coordinating return fire, those rebel ships deliberately rammed the Alliance vessels. The unexpected space conflict cost Stein's forces significant time and nearly 10% of his ground forces were killed before making planetfall. On the planet Izar, the locals abandoned the major cities and fled into the forests to organize a guerrilla war. Controlling the cities only pinned the Alliance Marines in place, and they were unable to effectively run a counterinsurgency. Tales of Marines going out on leave and picking up locals for... recreation often ended up finding the Marines' body on the side of the road. On Freedom, the Alliance forces discovered that the cities had been fortified and prepared for a lengthy siege. Though Freedom's defense forces numbered only about 1,500, they knew the terrain and they had plenty of time to prepare for the Alliance Marines. An attempt to take the city on June 15, 2236 was routed after Freedom's president, Tudela Dupont, led a raid on Alliance artillery and turned it on the attackers. With the bulk of the Alliance's forces arrived, they included the 23rd Alliance Striker Regiment. This was a unit that had previously participated in massacres of civilians, and their reputation for violence only grew as they proceeded to bombard Jefferson City for days, turning two-thirds of it into rubble. An assault on the city followed, which devolved into brutal building-by-building -building combat. Thousands died in the fighting before President DuPont and a few dozen of his loyal retinue were forced to abandon the city and flee into the nearby mountains. The Alliance had won, 
but the price of that victory was a PR nightmare. Instead of being cheered as heroes for crushing a dangerous rebellion, the Terran Alliance was painted as bullies and murderers of innocent people. By mid-2237, more than 50 planets had risen up in defiance of the Alliance government. The prospect of a quick victory was obliterated by the real politic. Unable to resupply and with only growing resentment and open defiance, the Terran Alliance gradually recalled their forces from the outer reaches in the last quarter of 2237. It was a classic case of not understanding that you could win every battle and still lose the war. That loss significantly changed the political climate on Terra, with a much more isolationist philosophy taking the reins. The Terran Alliance announced in 2242 that their authority moving forward would be limited to the 30 light year boundary around Terra. In effect, it had de facto granted independence to any planets outside of that radius, though it really was a symbolic gesture as most of those planets were already well aware that they were beyond Terran control. Independence was a bit of a double-edged sword for many of these worlds, who found themselves having to go it alone. Many were dependent upon trade and information from the Terran network. Others were left with obliterated economies and industrial bases following the conflict with the Alliance. It was an uncertain time, and more than a few colonies had to be abandoned when all hope was lost. Population shifted, and some traveled even further away from humanity's cradle on Terra in search of their destinies. One of those individuals who traveled further out into the unknown was Samantha Calderon. She had seen the brutality of the Alliance when her husband and two daughters were murdered by firing squad on Aix-la-Chapelle in 2236 and had no interest in maintaining any connection with Terra. With her husband's fortune granted from terraforming investments, she set out on a grand expedition into uncharted space. Leaving in 2250 with 2300 other individuals on 25 jump ships, the expedition said goodbye to Aix-la-Chapelle and headed out into the void. After 22 months of travel, Calderon's expedition reached the edge of the Hades Cluster, which was surrounded by a dense nebula of gas and dust. This hostile region had claimed more than a few exploring vessels previously, but the expedition made the choice to travel beyond it anyway. Though two ships were lost in the subsequent discovery of a dense asteroid field, a complex series of systems along with ten habitable worlds waited on the other side. On January 23rd, 2253, Samantha Calderon stepped down onto the soil of a planet that she would name Taurus in honor of her second husband, Victor Torrens, who did not survive the journey through the nebula. She had found an ideal location for a new settlement far from the prying eyes of the Terran Alliance. As inspiring as the Calderon expedition is, not everyone handled the war with the Terran Alliance by seeking a peaceful existence. Hector Worthington Rowe was a veteran of the conflict who had fought to defend the planet Alexandria from assault in 2237. Thousands of Alexandrians perished in the fighting, and Roe witnessed much of it. The experience scarred and embittered Roe, who sought retribution toward the Ateran Alliance for what had been done to Alexandria. Over time, this bitterness would be forged into hatred and desire for revenge. His focus turned to Lucianca, a planet which had been a staging area for Alliance forces during the war. Roe organized a force of 500 followers who traveled on freight jump ships to the planet disguised as a relief convoy. Not expecting anything like what was coming, the 151st Fusiliers who were based on Lucianca didn't have a chance. After ambushing and killing the commanding officers, Roe set up a kangaroo court which deemed the Fusiliers war criminals. After those perfunctory trials, torture and mass executions followed. Roe knew that his actions would mark him and his followers for an Alliance response, so he set course for the unknown void beyond settled space. After making the jump beyond the Dark Nebula, Roe and his followers found a single habitable planet orbiting a G5 star. They named it Apollo, and on September 8, 2250, the Rim World's Republic was formally established. Life was harsh on Apollo, as Roe's implementation of a bizarre system of government led to conflict and resentment over unfair treatment. Roe ended up actually taking his own life after one of his children deposed him in a vote of no confidence. What a tragic life. Meanwhile, in 2271, the Free Worlds League was formed by Sir George Humphreys, who sought cooperation between planets rather than predatory warfare. The Terran Alliance, which had been crumbling for decades, finally collapsed in 2314, its replacement, named the Terran Hegemony, big difference, right, would be formed a year later. 
The Federated Sons established their first government in 2317, and the Draconis Combine would form just two years later in 2319. Finally, the Lyran Commonwealth was born in 2340, and the Capellan Confederation in 2367. These fledgling houses would begin to exert control over nearby systems, either incorporating them into their governments, putting them to the torch, or chasing the inhabitants off into the void should they not want to join. The inner sphere was being born. Along with what would become the Great Houses, the smaller states on the edge of known space also grew, consolidated power, and sought to reinforce their independence. From the Torian Concordat to the Rim Worlds Alliance, these fledgling states would come into conflict with the Houses and repeatedly push back. They and the other tiny states on the edge of known space benefited from a concept called the Piranha Principle. The principle is explained through the use of predatory fish, which are forced to swim in schools of 20 or 30 fish. This is not done as a force amplifier, but to keep every member of that school in check by all the others. If you took a bite out of your neighboring fish, all the others would take advantage of that and consume the attacker. So while each individual periphery nation couldn't possibly defeat one of the major houses in a straight-up fight, doing so would place the house at risk of immediate destruction along its borders with the other major houses. So as long as the houses fought and distrusted each other, the periphery nations could survive. With the Reunification War and Amaris Civil War, the Piranha Principle was put to the test. When the Draconis Combine went to war with the Lyran Commonwealth in 2407, both houses sought an alliance with the Rim World's Republic. The fifth consul of the Republic, Heather Durant, rebuffed offers from both sides and sought to remain neutral in the conflict. Though officially staying out of it, Durant set up a spy network which would play both sides against each other while doing everything it could to benefit the Rimworlds with information, technology, and other long-term advantageous strategic positions. When the Lyran Commonwealth first began to field Battlemech technology, the Rimworlds were quick to obtain blueprints for their designs. The existence of this network of spies would end up haunting the Rimworlds Republic, and set the inner sphere ablaze after a series of cascading events. An attempt on the life of Lord Jacob Cameron, Director General of the Terran Hegemony, would lead an investigator by the name Terrans Ameris to the doorstep of the Rimworlds Republic. Though no direct evidence was ever found showing the assassins were connected to the Rimworlds, Ameris used her connections to entrench herself in the Rimworlds sphere of leadership. Lady Terrans and her husband, an ambassador from Terra, settled in the Republic and soon became permanent citizens. Lady Heather Durant and Ameris struck up a close friendship, and possibly even a romantic relationship. What isn't in doubt is that their bond grew strong over time. In 2459, Durant named Terence Ameris as heir to the Republic, as Durant was unmarried, had no children, and there were no close relatives. Going from Terran hegemony investigator to ruler of the Rimworld's Republic was quite a step up. Her descendants would rule over the Rimworld's Republic until 2786, when the Republic was officially disbanded. This, of course, would not be the last time the name Ameris would show up in the history of the Inner Sphere. On the other side of settled space, a fledgling state formed around the capital world of Canopus IV in the year 2530. Captain Cassandra Centrella, a savvy and intelligent Merrick officer, became a hero after her unit returned to House Merrick after being accidentally left behind on a Capellan world of Highspire. Though showered with praise, Centrella was jaded by the incompetence of her commanding officers and the Free Worlds League as a whole. Eventually, the discontent boiled over into action as she gathered supporters, captured Davion transport ships, and left Merrick space. They eventually settled in a series of systems named Canopus. The settlements grew and gradually Magistrix Centrella began to be more assertive concerning her presence and desire to establish relations with both House Merrick and the Capellan Confederation. It was entirely self-serving as she wanted to guarantee security while also expanding the growing magistracy. By 2548, Centrella had expanded the territory to include 36 border systems. With the negotiated end to the conflict between House Merrick and the Capellan Confederation, Terran Hegemony Director General Ian Cameron sought a lasting peace. He pushed the other great houses to sign agreements that would see an end to the Age of War that had taken so many lives across the Inner Sphere. Cameron would forge a new government body and turn the page in human history. The formation of the Star League presented both an opportunity and a threat to the periphery nations. The Piranha Principle, which had for so long guaranteed that no house could crush them without also being crushed in return, 
was now in jeopardy. Like kindling being piled up before starting a fire, the great houses now had a plethora of weapons and soldiers who no longer had any wars to fight. Entire economies and industrial production networks were set up to produce both weapons and warriors. A permanent, lasting peace put all of that at risk. What some argued the fledgling Star League needed was a common enemy that could reinforce these new bonds between houses. That enemy would be found in the periphery states. Starting in the early 2570s, a concerted and coordinated effort was made by government agents and planetary bureaucrats to start labeling the periphery states which had not joined the Star League as dangerous or rogue elements that could not be trusted. Hihiro Kurita outlined the argument in a Star League debate when he said the following in 2774. It is not a question of rights. The time has come for us to act in our own defense. If our grand alliance is to survive, we cannot survive without all humanity obeying the same creed, the same laws, the same social doctrines. As far as I am concerned, the barbarians beyond our borders are part of the Star League already, by virtue of common ancestry. Those who would oppose us are rebels and malcontents. No innocent man ever rebelled against lawful authority, and we, the Star League, are the law. Those who refuse to accept this proposition are, by the very act of their refusal, brigands to be crushed in order to maintain the common good. Do not preach to me about legalities. Why spoil the beauty of an idea with questions of legality? The four periphery confederations were painted as threats that needed to be dealt with sooner rather than later. The Outworld's alliance was viewed as a hive of lunatics who couldn't be taken seriously. The magistracy of Canopus was labeled an undisciplined rabble of deserters who would quickly be brought to heel. The Rimworld's Republic was firmly in control of the Ameris family, which was unpredictable and of questionable loyalty, even with their connections to the Star League. Finally, the Torian Concordat, which defied a lot of what the propaganda suggested about what it meant to live in the periphery. These were not uneducated lawless barbarians who resorted to piracy and cannibalism when the crops failed. The Concordat was standing on more than 200 years of successful societal and economic development. Their military was comparable technologically with that of the Inner Sphere, and the Torian soldiers were well-trained and capable. It was even the source of embarrassment when it was pointed out that the literacy rate among the peoples of the Concordat was higher than both the Draconis Combine and the Free Worlds League. The result of all this rhetoric was a dispute over a titanium-rich moon named Fontana. Though it was supposed to be shared between the Davions and the Torians, an accidental incursion by Torian vessels was interpreted as a prelude to an attack. The situation rapidly degraded as both sides sought to reinforce their holdings on the moon, and conflict broke out. Davion ships destroyed multiple Torian vessels, and many lives were lost. The Davions demanded mediation from the Camerons on Terra, but the Torians balked at the suggestion. In the Rimworld's Republic, internal strife was growing as independence movements put pressure on the nominally pro-Star League Ameris ruling government. In 2573, Gregory Ameris passed the Universal Act of Loyalty Law, which required every Rimworld Republic citizen to take an oath of loyalty. It also placed every person under the legal system of the Star League without any opportunity for local review. Again, this all sounds very familiar. Taking the oath was not voluntary. The entire idea went over like a lead balloon, even though it was an attempt by Gregory Ameris to find compromise with the Star League officials who wanted even more stringent controls. Even though 70% of the Rim Worlders ended up taking the oath, the remainder, and many who did take the oath, were filled with resentment. After significant pressure, the ruler of the Outworlds Alliance agreed to garrisons of Star League forces across Outworld planets in 2572. In public, the stated reason was for mutual defense and protection from pirates that operated in the region. The real reason was to remind the Outworlds Alliance citizenry that the Star League was the only real power in the galaxy. Kyrian soldiers stationed in an Outworlds Alliance city named Santiago City ended up sparking conflict after thrown snowballs from children prompted a soldier to respond with a tossed canister of coolant. A seven-year-old child was horrifically burned after being hit with the coolant and the resulting riot spiraled out of control. The Caridian soldiers called for reinforcements to deal with the crowd, and then when the additional forces showed up in riot gear, the angry crowd responded with thrown objects. The Caridian forces opened fire on the crowd, killing 27 civilians and wounding 30 more. 
Riots then sprung up across the Outworld's Alliance planets as a result of the Santiago Massacre. It seemed that whenever an option was presented to Star League officials, bureaucrats, and soldiers, they always seemed to take the route of antagonizing further conflict, either knowingly or unknowingly. What the people within the core of the Star League didn't understand concerning the periphery is that no matter how much talk there was concerning peace, prosperity, and technological advancement, most of those things never reached the people who lived far from Terra and the capital planets of the Great Houses. The periphery saw very few of the positives, yet were constantly put upon with the negatives and blamed for the wrongs in the universe. That, my friends, is a recipe for disaster. Attempts to find a negotiated solution to all the conflict that the Star League itself had generated were unsuccessful, as the periphery states were unwilling to take the blame or suffer any more indignities. The resulting conflict would be devastating to almost everyone in the Inner Sphere, and the consequences would fill human history with misery and tragedy for more than half a millennia. The four major periphery nations would come under attack by the Star League forces in what was politely described as the Reunification War. In reality, it was a four-front war intended to crush the periphery and end the last vestiges of independence that had been seeded back in those earliest days of human space exploration. Long-held rivalries, resentment, and anger boiled over into a direct conflict that would redefine the word brutality. Often overshadowed by the later Ameris Civil War and the Succession Wars, the Reunification War set the precedent for just how poorly human beings can treat others when given permission. The campaigns against the specific periphery states will have to be left for another video, but the end result was chaos, heartbreak, and economic collapse, and the execution of any pretense of idealism that the Star League was designed to further the interests of peace. On all fronts, the war was more difficult and bloodier than the Star League planners had imagined. The periphery states fell one by one, and by the end of the Reunification War, the Star League stood victorious over a bunch of rubble. First Lord Ian Cameron ordered funds to be spent to rebuild the shattered planets of the periphery, including efforts to spread propaganda that encouraged reconciliation and friendship under the Star League banner. This was more successful in some regions than others. The funds and opportunities also brought a new wave of immigrants from the Inner Sphere, which was referred by some as a second invasion. The Rim World's Republic fared better than the other periphery nations, largely due to Gregory Ameris, who was savvy enough to take advantage of his existing ties to the Star League. Unfortunately, the members of the Ameris family were ambitious and amoral to the extreme. They proceeded to murder each other over the course of many years in order to gain and retain power over the Republic. By the start of the 28th century, the Star League seemed at the verge of a perpetual golden age. At least, that's what it looked like from those who most benefited from it. On the outskirts and fringe of the League, long-held grudges burned. Being part of the Star League was good for many, but it was not enough for some who privately dreamed of taking power. As it was put by one Inner Sphere historian, the periphery was quiet, though not subdued, and passive, though not submissive. We're not going to go into the Ameris Crisis or the Civil War beyond stating that when the war came, the periphery nations were prepared after years of secretly ramping up military production of battle mechs, tanks, and firearms. As the Star League began to crumble, the periphery states were ready to reassert their independence. The war between Kerensky's SLDF and Stefan Ameris's forces gave the other periphery states a chance to breathe. It seemed the Piranha Principle would once again come into effect as the great houses of the Inner Sphere squabbled over the corpse of the Star League. The Rimworld's Republic was left in ruins and was slowly absorbed by the neighboring houses. Anyone who served in the former government, Ameris or not, was excluded, hunted down, and often executed. What rose up in the Republic's place was a series of small banded kingdoms that fought over the scraps. The large periphery states largely avoided being dragged into the succession wars and benefited from that. Though the Torian Concordat and Magistracy of Canopus did end up in conflict with each other, it wasn't world ending like what was happening between the Great Houses. Over the centuries, the people of the periphery had suffered and caused suffering. They led and had been led. Even as we move into the era of the Ill Clan, the long-held misconceptions of people from the periphery being uneducated and wild cousins persists. In some cases, it's true, but in many others, it does the people of these planets on the edge of human civilization a disservice. The periphery remains a place where laws can be hard to come by and fortunes can be made and lost quickly. 
There will always be people who seek to buck the norm, seek their own path, and resist the pressure to conform. That sort of person is always going to be drawn to the edges of what is known, what is held, and will seek to push beyond even that. And that's usually a very good thing. No matter what happens in the O-Clan era, it is indisputable that the periphery states will have a role to play and even expand their influence. It is possible that a reverse Piranha effect will come into play and the periphery states will start to feed on the remnants of the Great Houses. We already saw a hint of that with Dominions Divided, as the Torians repulsed an attack by House Davion and then went on the offensive. Could we see a Magistracy of Canopus start to gobble up those former Free Worlds League worlds? It's more likely than not. It's a wild galaxy out there. Who knows what could happen? Thanks for watching. I hope this little journey through some of the history of the periphery was entertaining and enlightening. There's still a ton of great lore out there for the periphery states, and I would absolutely recommend picking up that old periphery source book from the Catalyst Online Store. It has a lot of what is in this video, as well as much more on those big four periphery states. Plus, the artwork in it is 80s camp, and I just love it. It's really, really good. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit all the buttons. Big thanks to the Ko-Fi supporters and everybody else who helps keep this all running and supporting me as we make videos like this happen. Until we see each other again, take care, go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.